Today's sponsor is Datadog, a real-time monitoring platform that unifies metrics, logs, and distributed traces from your cloud containers and orchestration software. Datadog's container-centric monitoring features allow you to track the health and performance of your dynamic container environment. The container map provides a bird's-eye view of your container fleet, and the live container view searches, groups, and filters your containers with any criteria, like tags, pods, or workspaces. To start monitoring your container clusters, sign up for a free trial today, and Datadog will send you a free t-shirt. Visit datadog.com slash container dash cloudcast to get started. That's datadog.com slash container dash cloudcast. Cloudcast Media presents from the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. This is the Cloudcast with Aaron Delp and Brian Gracely, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome back to the Cloudcast. We are coming to you live from the massive Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. October is upon us, the last quarter of 2022. Boy, the year has gone fast. Hope everybody is doing well. And if you were in the path of uh, Hurricane Ian anywhere uh, along the East Coast or southern part of the United States, uh, we're actually going all the way up the, up the coast. Hope you're staying safe. Uh, we did not get hit too badly here in North Carolina. Thank goodness, some trees down and some odds and ends, but uh, much, 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 much better than uh, some folks uh, further south from us. So anyways, hope everybody's doing well. Another Sunday Perspective show. Excited to kind of get into this one. And, you know, it's interesting, you know, when you've, when you've covered this space for a long time, like Aaron and I have, um, sometimes things seem to run together. Uh, as you, as you heard, if you listen to last week's show, sometimes things seem sort of boring and, but sometimes there's some stuff that comes along that makes you go, Hmm, some things are changing. We're, we're at a tipping point at some things. And I, I say that in the context of, you know, if you've listened to the show for a long time, uh, you know, Aaron and I have always kind of had this follow the money mindset. And if you go back a number of years, and you have to go back quite a few years before the public cloud was kind of a thing, but let's say we, we kind of go back to one of the milestone sort of 2008 sort of years, you know, there was an interesting stat that came out from somewhere, and I forget where it was. It might have been one of the venture capitalists. It might have just been one of the analysts or somebody. They said, you know, we knew that the cloud was a big thing when the way that venture capital used to work was you would, uh, and this is going to be hard for a lot of people to sort of fathom, but um you know, you would go to a venture capitalist, you'd have a business idea, you'd go to a VC and quite honestly, and they would, they would say this, like the first $50 million in venture capital would literally go to, uh, four or five companies. It would go to Cisco for networking gear. It would go to EMC for storage gear. It would go to sun for, for computing and, and like web servers and stuff like that. And then it would go to like Oracle. And, and then what happened was when the cloud came along, all of a sudden, the VCs said, hey, we're going to give you one-tenth the amount of money that we gave you before in various rounds. And that first $5 million we give you is probably going to go uh, towards Amazon Web Services or one of the cloud providers, but obviously, in, in many cases, Amazon Web Services. And so that was a big tipping point. It was a big tipping point in terms of um, you know the efficiency of capital at which people could raise money. Um, they could focus more of their time on on developing as opposed to having to you know basically like build a data center or you know build a colo or you know give a whole bunch of money to these vendors and then figure out how to put it all together. You could get started. You could do things quickly. Um, and and the VCs love this because not only were they able to kind of realize if the money they had invested in early rounds was going to pan out. But they love the idea of disrupting the IT industry because a lot of what they were in, in, uh, investing in were things that were potentially disruptive to the IT industry one way or the other. Well, things are things are kind of flipping, and we're going to kind of dig into where things are starting to flip and how the VCs who used to be you know huge fans of the public cloud are now starting to become uh, very much fighting back against the public cloud. And we'll kind of dig into that after the break. Today's show is sponsored by Cloud Zero. For software-driven companies focused on growing margins, Cloud Zero is the only cloud cost intelligence platform that puts engineering in control by connecting technical decisions to business results. By analyzing cloud services like AWS and Snowflake, Cloud Zero provides real-time cost insights that help you maximize margins. Engineering teams can answer critical questions like, who are my most expensive customers? How much does this specific feature cost our business? What's the cost impact of re-architecting this application? With cost anomaly alerts via Slack, product-specific data views, and granular engineering context that makes it easy to investigate any cost, Cloud Zero is your complete cloud cost intelligence platform, connecting the dots between high-level trends and individual line items. Join companies like Drift, 
Rabbit7, and SeatGeek by visiting cloudzero.com slash cloudcast to get started today. That's cloudzero.com slash cloudcast. Buffering. How annoying. Did you know that 17 out of 20 people stop watching a video because of stalling and rebuffering? Don't let your users click away to a competitor's site. If your business lies on online media, rely on CDN 77 to deliver a seamless online experience to your audience. CDN 77 is one of the leading global providers of content delivery network services. They power the world's most popular websites and apps such as Udemy, ESL Gaming, Live Sports TV, and social media platforms. Aside from their massive and redundant global network, you're going to love their no BS attitude and skilled team of engineers ready to help 24-7. No chatbots, no tickets bouncing around unresolved for days, just people who know your use case and can immediately help you pinpoint and fix the problems. Don't wait until your users run out of patience. Go to cdn77.com slash cloudcast and ask for a free trial with no duration or traffic limits. That's cdn77.com slash cloudcast. And we're back. And as I mentioned at the top of the show, we're going to dig into a little bit of what feels like, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's early data points. Sometimes, um, you know, you'd love to see 20 or 30 data points that validate a trend that you're starting to see. But, you know, sometimes having done this for a long time, you start to see some early things and you go, hmm, this is definitely something we want to keep an eye on. And what that thing is, is, as I mentioned at the top of the show, for for a long time, uh, the VC world loved the public cloud because um, it was, um, to a certain extent, cheaper, uh, especially for what they like to do, which is, you know, validate if ideas are real, right? So, you know, let's figure out a year, let's figure out two years, let's figure out three years of if this idea is real, if the technology can pan out, <clears throat> if the companies we're investing in can figure out how to become profitable or grow the business or, or retain customers. So they're not necessarily in things for the long term. Um, and I know VCs will argue with me that, oh, we're you know partners with our companies for a long time. But in the early stages, you're trying to figure out if something is real because you, know, you, you invested a lot of things. And so the public cloud was a fantastic way of doing that because you weren't, as I mentioned at the beginning, giving the first $50 million to... Uh, you weren't giving the first $50 million to, to Cisco, EMC, Sun, and and, uh, and Oracle. You were giving it to, say, AWS or Google or Amazon, right, or DigitalOcean or whoever you were. And and that worked for a long time because not only, uh, you know, were there a lot of, was there a lot of money being pumped into um, what was going on? So <clears throat> more and more public cloud was was uh, was getting innovative. Um, so new ideas were coming along and obviously they were they were talking to these startup companies. And if you think you know you think back to it and again, sometimes you got to remember where we came from, you know, in the earliest days of, of AWS and, and a lot of the clouds, but AWS in particular, you know, all of the early stage customers were, you know, st- what felt like startup companies, right? Now they grew into big companies. They became Uber and Shopify and Spotify and, you know, or, you know all sorts of companies, interesting companies, right? Netflix and, and lots of things. But at the beginning, they were what felt like, oh, these are startup companies. Startup companies go to the cloud, not enterprise companies, but startup companies go to the cloud. And so, you know, you had this you know, sort of interesting relationship that VCs had with the public cloud and that, um, you know, they were able to eliminate one of the things that was a, a huge burden for them, which was all this upfront capital that was going to things that weren't necessarily driving the product. And, um, you know, they were doing things at new and interesting scale that was very difficult to do with some of that product. And the cloud providers, uh, you know, were very interested in that sort of thing. Obviously, you know, Amazon being uh, the first and best customer of AWS had to do things at scale anyway. So they were interested in in how this was evolving. And and so, you know, and, and you had, uh, you know, most VCs basically saying like, hey, if you're a, an old guard company, if you're a software company, if you're a hardware company, like you're essentially dead to them, right? Like they want to be in the SaaS business or they want to be in, you know, PaaS businesses or, you know, whatever those things were going to be. And and that relationship in that sort of love affair seemed to go on for for quite a while. And, you know, you didn't really hear too, too much uh, about it. I mean, you would hear from time to time when um, you talk to some of the VCs who are investing in in open source software companies. And I, I say open source software companies, I mean like companies whose core technology was based on open source and they were trying to, to build a commercial company around that. And we're, we're actually going to talk about that in, a, in an upcoming um, Sunday Perspectives. There was a really interesting article written by Stephen O'Grady over at Red Monk, who we, we really like and admire. We're going to talk about that. But for the most part, you know, you didn't 
there, you know, there was, there was very much an appreciation, sort of a simpatico uh, adjacency between the VC world and the public cloud. And I feel like that all sort of changed uh, about a year ago, a year and a half ago or so. Um, and it really kind of came out first and foremost uh, from the folks at A16Z. Uh, Martin Casado uh, came out and he had an article that, that got a lot of noise. Um, he since feels like he sort of walked it back uh, on one of the other podcasts. But, you know, basically it was, um, I think he called it the the, the trillion dollar uh, cost of cloud or the cloud paradox. It was basically like, you know, the cloud's making a ton of money, uh, the public cloud, AWS, Azure, Google are making a ton of money. And because they're making so much money, um, it is becoming an overwhelmingly large cost for uh, companies that are built and born in the cloud, right? Essentially companies who, you know, are only in the cloud, right? Which, you know, a lot of companies are SaaS companies and, and doing whatever they do. But it, essentially his argument was, um, you know, those companies, once they reach a big size, right? Once they get past all that experimentation stage. And once they get past the, you know, spending more money than they're bringing in to acquire customers, which is again, early stage, typical company kind of stuff. Once they get to a point of, you know, potentially being profitable and to a certain extent, potentially being somewhat stable in size, right? Like, so they're not growing astronomically quarter over quarter, year over year. Um, you know, his argument was, well, at that point, the cloud becomes incredibly expensive, and, you know, companies should start thinking about repatriating those applications back into some sort of private cloud thing. And he made this sort of interesting argument. Um, and you could kind of understand the argument if you just looked at it from the perspective of like, oh, you know, there's a line item in your balance sheet or, you know, in your profit and loss statement that's getting too big and essentially, you know, comparative to, you know, where it's driving value. And of course, the problem with his argument um, that many, many, many people push back on was, well, repatriation is by no means easy. And, you know, you you can't just sort of invent your way into having AWS-like scale in your data center. That's the reason why AWS existed and so many companies haven't been able to replicate AWS or Azure or Google because it's really hard to do. And, you know, so the argument against Martin's thesis and A16Z thesis was basically like, yeah, you point out like one, maybe two examples, something like a Dropbox, but you don't really come up with any others. And that was fine. And we did a show about it, oh, you know, 150 shows ago or so last year um, and kind of talked about it and the complexities of it and so forth. But it was the first time you really heard the VCs basically saying like, uh, we're not happy with how the clouds evolved. And you know, essentially what they were saying was like, look, we're in this for our companies to be highly profitable and be able to return, you know, come back and make returns for us, whether those are returns that, you know, uh, you, you could give the money back to the VCs uh, as like an investor, or you could sell the company or preferably you go IPO and you continue to, you know, generate free cash flows and, and profits and all those sort of wonderful things. And they were essentially, you know, saying like, look, we, uh, we've sort of flipped on the cloud. We, we, we're, we're now realizing that the monster that we have been funding for so long indirectly um, is now creating a situation in which uh, the profits that we used to live on and used to love and used to be able to, you know, fund our next round of, of you know, sort of next VC funds and whatever, those aren't coming to us anymore. Those are staying with the cloud providers. And, you know, they never really kind of come out and explicitly say that. They're sort of saying like, hey, as a responsible business, you shouldn't be spending this much in IT. But, you know, in essence, as the people coming out saying it, they were saying like, hey, we we would like to be keeping more of the money. We're tired of the cloud providers keeping more of the money, right? So essentially they've created sort of, you know, IT vendors 2.0, which is what they were so excited about disrupting. So it was interesting. It happened about, you know, a year and a half ago or so, I think it was when it was. And it was one of those inflection points where you went, hmm, Okay. Um, you know, I guess if you had looked far enough out and you'd been looking at like people like AWS's, uh, you know, P&L, which is starting to get more out there, like they're making 85% profits, right? Like they're, they're making at least gross profits like software companies, which is, you know, very much unheard of for, for cloud providers, you know, essentially, you know, companies that are making their own hardware. So they'd gotten incredibly efficient and it was almost like they hadn't been paying attention to it or something. And so, you know, you sort of thought about that uh, last year, whenever it was, and you went, huh, okay. 
there's an interesting sort of thing going on here. And maybe it was, you know, foretelling that, you know, they were starting to raise that red flag, you know, a year and a half ago, you know, kind of prior to some of the, the valuations we're now seeing in the tech sector, which seem to be, you know, somewhat inflated. Uh, they've been inflated for a long time. Um, and, you know, we're not seeing IPOs, right? We have to find the tweet that's out there. But basically, I think there's only been like 30 or 40 IPOs total this year, up, you know, down from like several hundred the last few years. So, you know, that route isn't necessarily available anymore. And so you go, okay, so that that's interesting. It's a data point, uh, but it's one of the larger VCs and it's, you know, one of the more vocal VCs, right? One of the ones who, you know, likes to sort of control their own destiny and control the media narratives and all those sort of things. And then this past week, I think last week, maybe last 10 days or so, there was another very interesting thing that happened. And I think it's sort of, you know, again, another dot on the connecting the dots as to where things are going and the fact that I think we we are at the beginning of a of an interesting shift that's happening. And that's uh, Cloudflare. So Cloudflare announced, uh, so Cloudflare, let me put this in perspective. And we've been sort of interested in Cloudflare for a long time as, you know, thinking of like how how can the big three clouds be disrupted? And one of the biggest things that, that Cloudflare has tried to do is they have you know been very big advocates that one of the one of the biggest problems, if you will, uh, for the public cloud or of the public cloud for for customers is their bandwidth costs, their network costs have never come down, right? So if you remember, if you listen to the show for long enough, if you watched enough AWS reInvent keynotes, you know one of the things that they always used to talk about in the reInvent keynote was. Hey, it's the 27th price cut of EC2 or the 16th price cut or the 42nd price cut or whatever it was. You know, every quarter, every two weeks, every month, every whenever it was, they wanted to let you know that, hey, the prices were coming down. And it was a great, you know, it was a great thing. It was a, you know, kind of economies of scale um, as they were getting bigger. But it was also a fantastic sort of marketing slogan of like, hey, um, your traditional IT vendors prices never come down. But look, we're, we're the new IT vendors. And our prices come down. And again, it was economies of scale. They were delivering more more compute. They were able to buy more compute at lower prices, able to pass those savings on to you, kind of the Amazon model of, hey, um, nobody ever wants to pay more. And it was great. And you don't really hear that anymore. You don't really hear much about that anymore. You don't hear much about S3 price reductions, maybe once a year, maybe you hear about it. Now the big thing is like, hey, you should move over to ARM. Um, as opposed to sort of EC2 Intel based price cuts. And, you know, maybe we've just sort of reached a point where they're not going to get that much lower. But Cloudflare came along, and there was a couple of companies who have done this who have sort of said, no, the thing you should be looking at is bandwidth cost, because bandwidth cost are like 10x what you should be paying or 30x. I forget what it was, and we've covered this in a show before. But they basically were like, we are going to go after. Uh, AWS's profits. We're going to go after essentially network bandwidth, and we're going to deliver bandwidth at a much more reasonable cost price point. And we're going to try and create this, I think they called it like the bandwidth alliance. I forget exactly what I was. I have to go back and look at my notes. Um, but they were basically saying like, you know, the kind of classic, like one company's profit is our business model. And so they were going to try and go after uh, bandwidth. And one of the things that they ended up announcing was you know, Cloudflare is very well known as a security company, but also known as a CDN company. And, you know, typically from a CDN perspective, you are just simply putting, <clears throat> you know, content or images or static pages out at the edge um, into their CDN network. It allows people to have, you know, closer proximity to where the content that they're trying to download is coming from, makes your downloads faster, makes your screens render faster, all that sort of stuff. And then they started doing something that was a little bit different uh, called Cloudflare Workers. And they really kind of got into the idea of, hey, instead of just being a place where you put your content and we serve it up from a CDM perspective, what if we just start giving you edge computing, sort of, you know, computing at the edge of our CDN network, right? So maybe not edge computing in the way you think about like, hey, it's a little tiny computer on, on a light post doing some sort of like, um, you know, pressure monitoring or temperature monitoring for like a city or something, or, uh, you know, a little kind of computer inside of a manufacturing thing doing edge computing, right? The $3 computer kind of thing, but like CDN edge. And they said, Hey, what if we start putting compute out there? And what was really, and so you were like, Oh, okay, well, that's kind of interesting. And you know, there'll probably be some, some use cases that work around that. But what was really interesting this week, and I think it's another point, uh, in the sort of, you know, strings that are being kind of pulled, uh, 
about VCs starting to look for ways to sort of push back against, you know, IT 2.0 or the big three cloud providers is uh, a number of them kind of got together and uh, put together about $1.25 billion in essentially venture funding for startups that are willing to build on Cloudflare workers, right? So essentially what they're saying is, hey, same thing we've done for a long time, you know, venture funding uh, for your startup, A rounds, B rounds, whatever it might be. But instead of telling you that that first $5 million needs to go to AWS, they're now telling you explicitly don't go to AWS or Azure or Google, bring it over here to Cloudflare workers. And, you know, as best we can tell, the reason they're doing that is A, they're tired of giving more of their profits over to those three cloud providers. And B, they're trying to be part of how do they kickstart this idea of starting to chip away at the biggest profit areas for the cloud providers. And so this is going to be really interesting, right? We, we've seen um, we've seen a number of companies that are starting to become kind of, you know, serverless uh, web kind of companies, Vercel and um, NetLafly and a number of others that are starting to do this. And it'll be really interesting given, you know, how big Cloudflare is um, and some of these things, whether this is sort of the next salvo, the next, uh, I hate to use war analogies, but sort of bomb thrown in this new war between VCs and the big three cloud providers. And I think essentially what it's doing is the, the VCs are trying to frame this as the big, cl- big three cloud providers are now the new Cisco, EMC, Sun, and Oracle, and you should start treating, you know, at least in this case, Cloudflare as the new AWS. And it'd be really interesting to watch going forward whether or not we see more and more of these things happening, right? Will there be uh, other CDNs that are able to do this? Will you see uh, AWS, Azure, and Google start to do their own startup programs in which they fund companies or do it through credits or however they do it? But I think this is going to be really interesting to watch this new uh, sort of age of how VCs are trying to shape the market, how they're trying to do it in a profitable way, and maybe how they're trying to prop up, you know, competitors to these big three who have now become, again, sort of the new, uh, you know, first $5 million companies, um, how they're going to do that. So I think it's going to be interesting to watch. I think, you know, sometimes when these little these little blips pop up, they become bigger trends. You just kind of got to watch and see if they they multiply in terms of the number of times they happen. But, uh, you know, just these last two data points, and again, coming from, you know, a couple of fairly large VCs getting behind this, uh, it's definitely something to keep an eye on. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Um, hope everybody's doing well this week. Hope everybody's staying safe. Uh, excited to be getting into Q4. Excited to be getting into the fall. It def- weather's definitely dropping. Leaves are starting to change all over the place. I'm hearing a lot of people, uh, you know, going off and doing the fall thing. You know, you're getting to wear hoodies and sweatshirts and jeans and going apple picking and uh, looking at leaves and and doing hiking and all sorts of fun outdoor stuff. So enjoy it out there. Um, Good to be with you all this week. Uh, This last month was the second highest we've ever had. Uh, The first highest was was this past summer. But uh, yeah, this last three or four months, this actually this whole year has been um, the biggest numbers we've ever had. So uh, thank you to everybody who's telling a friend. Thank you to everybody who's helping us grow the show, helping us uh, grow the community. Um, if you get a chance, please give us a rating on um, on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you get your show. If you can give us a five-star rating, it's great. Um, it helps make it easier for people to find the show if they're looking for cloud computing content. So uh, excited to be with you, and we will talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to The Cloudcast. Please visit thecloudcast.net to find more shows, show notes, videos, and everything social media. 